Welcome to Framing the Hammer, the podcast by 4A Arts, the American Alliance of Artists and Audiences. We believe that arts and culture are basic human rights and powerful tools for building a whole and healthy society. We aim to change the narrative around arts, culture, design, and craft for American society to ultimately influence how elected leaders at the local, state, and federal levels support and fund them. On Framing the Hammer, we engage in stimulating conversations with people from throughout the artist uh, ecosphere and throughout the creative economy to advance the social movement we are trying to inspire. Today, I am so lucky to be joined by Richard Deming. He is a professor of and lecturer in English and the director of creative writing at Yale University. He's also an award-winning poet and critic whose work explores the intersections of literature, philosophy, and visual culture. And most poignantly right now for this podcast, he is the author of multiple books, including most recently a book called This Exquisite Loneliness, which dives into the idea and history of um, commingling uh, loneliness and creativity. And thank you for joining us, Richard. How are oh, you? It's today? terrific to be here, Gavin. Thanks Good. so much for this uh, opportunity to talk with you. So, Richard, is there a piece of work of any genre that sticks with you as having been a artistic experience in your childhood? I mean, there was a, a sort of like... Um, in some ways, that origin story that I was, my brother's about 10 years older than I am. And when I was in first grade, so I was about six or seven, and he was 16 or 17, and he was in high school. Um, both of my parents worked, and he um, did some drama in the school. And every year, they would do like a musical and comedy one semester, and the other semester, they would do something classic and, mm -hmm. or, you know, classical. And because my parents worked, they would have me often go sit in the auditorium while the play was being rehearsed, because mm -hmm. then everybody there could kind of keep an eye on me. But it was, you know, I could do my own thing in the seats as long as I didn't really leave the auditorium. Um, and I remember, uh, like I said, it was about six or seven. And the play that they were working on that semester was... Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. All right. And, um, you know, I really got caught up in it. And I think it was, you know, which sounds really precocious, except, you know, it was kind of a great experience in that, or a, a great introduction in that, you know, the teacher who was, you know, the director of the play would have to keep stopping the lines to kind of explain to the, the high school kids what they were talking about yeah a little um, uh, some yeah. dramaturgical work going on there to explain just what what's the sense of all these words oh for sure for sure and you know and it alludes you know high school kids and um and but i also didn't have to i wasn't memorizing it i wasn't caught up in the like i, I just have to know this to know this line mm -hmm. um and you know also it was my brother who was doing it so that it's it's not you know like that really demystified it I mean, it was sort of like day after day. And then I came home, you know, from my, uh, from one of these times. And I said, hey, mom, can we read Julius Caesar? Because I wanted to see it on the page. Yeah. And so there I am, a seven-year-old, reading with my mother Shakespeare, which again, just really demystified it. And it was, I think that sense of like the language and that the language being something different something heightened um but somehow special and and a collective experience you know like you know the students the high school students and me and all of us trying to figure out the meaning together um it really i think was a really important thing for i mean i, I ended up being in music for a long time um because the other play that year was west side story and so i came home saying Hey mom, I want drum lessons because percussion is really amazing wow. in that. Yeah. And and that's really kind of what developed that aspect of my life. But it was really that I think that just that year of being, you know, babysat and watching these plays and and seeing it deconstructed and then reconstructed in front of my eyes that really made that powerful. 
kind of like Zora Neale Hurston, who toured with the Gilbert and Sullivan uh, troupe, right? Yeah, exactly. And when you when you join the circus a little bit, it's so infectious, and <laughs> you you want to be with all of the 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 circus folk of theater. I love that. Um, so I want to begin with the end in mind. I have an agenda in having you on this uh, podcast, which is being able to talk in large part, as I stated in the introduction to the show, we want to think about wellness in the country. And we really think that art is a large part in having a a healthy whole society. So I'm curious, you're a writer, Mm -hmm. a researcher, not necessarily a therapist, but certainly a philosopher. But can you say, are there lessons from your book that can relate and inspire our country as we struggle along with uh, what is increasingly identified as an epidemic of loneliness? Well, I think that, you know, um, part of my feeling about this stuff is that um, it's not, I mean, I think that that people think of art um, mostly in terms of expression and so i want to you know get out my ideas i want to get out my internal self and interior Mm -hmm. self and have it i think it absolutely it's part of that but i think that um in some ways this goes back to the anecdotes i was telling just a second ago where it's 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 not only that it is um the sort of possibility of of engagement or interaction um, between, um, I create something and put it into the world, but then the world, if it picks it up, picks it up and reads it in its own way and, and can, you know, hopefully be, um, turned on and inspired to do their own thing. I mean, I think it's true of a lot of artists that, you know, it's nice when people come and say, oh, I really loved your book. I really loved, um, your poem poet, et cetera. Um, it's, that's super nice. Obviously it's much more exciting and affirming when someone said, someone says, Oh, I read this and I went home and just wrote like, that's, that's kind of when you feel like you've connected, when you've created this, uh, possibility for other, for other people to want to reach out and be part of that larger, uh, possibility of creating engagement and collaboration and conversation. And so it, it, it is both those things uh, of wanting to, yeah, express, but express so that it can be of use to other people. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, you know, that that's just generally true of, I mean, it's like when you're listening to a song and you start singing along. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, that old truism about the velvet underground that, you know, like only 30 people would come to their shows, but every one of those people went home and started a band like that. That's, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's part of, uh, it's really part of that, like creating that, those possibilities for, for art, um, and which is why it's so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to write this book? Well, I mean... Uh, the very specific, um, occasion is something I talk about in the book, which was, I was writing an essay about the movie Synecdoche in New York by Mm -hmm. Charlie Kaufman, which is just amazing. And it's really, it's a devastating, it's like the saddest movie I know. Mm -hmm. I was in the middle of writing it and a friend of mine, uh, called, and this is someone who I'd been friends with for years and years. We had gotten sober together and he said, Hey, you know, that guy you're writing about? I said, what, what, I mean, he just sort of like, he didn't even say hello. You know, that guy you're writing about? (laughs) I was on the phone and I said, who, who, you know, in that movie. And I said, Philip Seymour Hoffman is the star. of. Yeah. He just, he just died Uh, and he overdosed. And, you know, uh, Hoffman had been someone who um, was friends of friends and we had some geography in common, things like that. And, um, but he had also been, sober for a long time and then um had you know some really you know tough years and and ended up overdosing alone in an apartment and um that's kind of what reminded me i mean and loneliness is at the core of that movie that i was writing about anyway right 
And Hoffman, you know, as I say in the book, is the Marlon Brando of loneliness. And <laughs> I, I realized just what the stakes of loneliness are. And it's loneliness is something that I've, you know, felt chronically throughout my life. Uh, and that's when I really decided that I wanted to, if those are the stakes, I really think it's necessary to try to explore what loneliness is and what it means and how it's a factor in people's lives and um, really to understand it because, and also, you know, Gavin, part of it is that um, there's so much shame and stigma attached to loneliness that I mm -hmm. wanted to um, just figure out how kind of common it is, how ubiquitous, mm -hmm. how, what part of our human um, capacities are linked to loneliness. And so I thought, oh, okay, there's no better way to dive in. And so just started to, to think and read and write about it. It's a gift you're giving people also to be reminded, uh, as you insinuated there, to let people know that they're not the only ones who feel lonely or um, alone, which are certainly two very different things, being alone and feeling lonely. But it's, um, it's important to realize, for, especially for us being human social beings, that sometimes crave companionship and yet don't want it. But it's, it's okay to know that um, lots of us, maybe most of us, feel lonely some, at some point in our lives, maybe a lot of our lives. And as a father of my kids, I'm constantly wanting to, as we're navigating middle school, um, we're navigating, you know, the the ins and outs of friendships and frankly, loneliness already at the, 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 a middle school age, which is heartbreaking. And then I don't want to to uh, be so pessimistic as to say, sweetie, we got to figure out loneliness now because it's going to be a <laughs> lifelong struggle. <laughs> right. Well, so um, the full title of the book, which I'm sorry, I didn't actually say earlier, is um, This Exquisite Loneliness, What Loners, Outcasts, and the Misunderstood Can Teach Us About Creativity. And with that full title, I am curious, there are uh, six profiles or almost case studies that you make about various people throughout history who vary from writers to TV producers uh, to photographers, uh, etc. And they all really do have their own loneliness journeys that uh, spurred their creativity. Can you say what uh, what drew you along to those six figures in particular? Yeah, I knew that I wanted to um, talk about other people's loneliness. I mean, I my own story is is part of it, but I realized that that would only take me so far, and it couldn't give me um, a perspective beyond beyond my own. And and you know, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of blind spots that any of us have, and sort of thinking mm -hmm. about our own internal lives. And so I wanted to reach out and, and bring other people in who had pretty clearly um, acknowledged the role of loneliness in their lives. Mm -hmm. And, but all of them are, are pretty different. Um, and so that they would come, they would allow me to come at loneliness from different angles and to see different facets and refractions and reflections of it. So I knew I wanted to do a good range of people. And so, yeah, and then some of them were, like I start with Melanie Klein, who's a pioneering psychoanalyst, sort of a protege of the Freud school, a frenemy of Anna Freud, Sigma <laughs> Freud's daughter. And she, late in life, um, wrote just a really kind of a masterpiece of an essay on loneliness and part of it was informed by her own years of grief um uh, a son who had died a, a brother who had died early um a difficult marriage that had her then become basically a you know moving from country to country and she um comes down there's sort of a famous story of her coming down one day in her 70s and she has a, a housekeeper who lives there with her and um, she walks into the kitchen and just says, you know, do you ever feel lonely? And the, you know, the, the housekeeper said, well, of course. And then she hears the answer and then just kind of drifts off and then begins writing this, this essay 
Um, and, you know, I think it's because of that loneliness of the end of, you know, near the end of her life. Um, and, but she is someone who gives us the sort of tools for thinking about the psychological implications and sources mm -hmm. of being lonely. Mm -hmm. And like for her, it is that, um, that loneliness really begins, that our, our subjectivity, our sense of who we are begins out of loneliness. It's that moment when we realize that we're separate beings from our mother, mm -hmm. that we, until then we feel this kind of wholeness and we realize that we're separate and it's this sort of like, almost like fall from Eden, like, oh, wait a minute, I'm now conscious of, that I'm a self different from that person. And that, you know, what Klein sees as part of that kind of humanity's makeup is that we're continually striving to get back to that sense of a wholeness with some other being that is so complete that we feel no, no disconnection. And of course, even the best relationship, the best marriage, whatever, will never, you will always have that difference built into you. Um, and so that's, you know, I wanted to have her as a thinker in, in place. And then from there, it started to just kind of fold out into people or, or things that had already branched into my life. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them like Zora Neale Hurston, who was just, a, you know, one of the great novelists of American literature with her, her great novel, Her Eyes Are Watching God. Um, someone when I was young and kind of at my loneliness had given me her, uh, Hurston's memoir in which she talks all about her loneliness. And it, like that came back to me. Um, I wrote a chapter on Rod Serling and some of that came out of, um, you know, I've been a kid when I was a kid, I loved the twilight zone. And in my life, I'm, I've seen every episode of the twilight zone countless times. But my beloved a few years ago was, had a fellowship in Western Massachusetts. So she was gone for a semester she, and, you know, we had kind of arranged that she would either come back down to Connecticut or I would go up there for the weekend. But it was, you know, the winter and it was a snowy winter that year. So there were a lot of weekends that, you know, even that fell through. But certainly during the, the, the week I was on my own and I just said, you know, she would never go with this. I'm going to watch an episode of the twilight zone every day mm -hmm. and you know, whatever else I'm doing, I'm just going to watch it. Cause I'd never watched it systematically. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, something to do. And what became pretty clear to me pretty quickly was that the twilight zone, I mean, people think of it as, you know, scary or sci-fi or maybe yeah. with a moral twist. Um, and of course it is all those things, but in reality, especially when you watch a lot of them, it's about loneliness. Most of the episodes have some element of that kind of sense of isolation or alienation, or like I said, um, aloneness. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, so I wanted to know more about how Serling came out of that space, like how, how he could write loneliness in this way that was really just part of its DNA. And then found out about his own life that was so fascinating that he was a war hero in World War II, um, decorated and had been injured in combat and that he, um, he, his father died near the end of his tour of duty and, and uh, Serling grew up in, in Binghamton. And by the, by the time the military mail got to the Philippines, the, the funeral had passed, all of it had passed. In fact, by the time that Serling was discharged, uh, went home, his family, his mother had moved to a different place. His, his mm -hmm. brother um, had already moved to DC. So he, you know, all the things that he had been thinking about in the war, about getting home and how much of home meant, and he's fighting for home. And then he goes home and there's no home there uh -huh. anymore. Like that, you start to see, oh, well, this is, this is part of his, his story. And this is true of really all of the other people that I was looking at. Like it just, there were people that, the figures like Walker Evans, the photographer who just took these really amazing photographs in the New York subway. Um, and they were incredibly revealing and it's just portraits of loneliness. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, like I said, all of these figures just started to kind of come forward, especially when I said, well, okay, I want to, to see how, you know, maybe a painter deals with it. And, and, right. but part of it is like, like anything there, there are people that, 
the figures that were already probably pretty close to me. And then why are they close to me? Oh, right. there's this recurring theme of loneliness. And then you start to look at it and it comes out of the, the pattern comes out of the, uh, out of the material. And the fact that these are figures who all embraced their loneliness or acknowledged it or, or directly dealt with it, um, is, is a, an important through line and also really fascinating. What you mentioned about Rod Sering too, makes me think about sometimes our those of us who have not served in the military are sometimes surprised by the sense of camaraderie that people soldiers will miss the times that they spent in really really intense stressful times in wartime and we can't imagine why they would want to go back to that but talk about a lack of loneliness because of the camaraderie that they feel with their um brothers and sisters in arms i would imagine that's um talk about a way of overcoming loneliness despite the stress um one more question about loneliness or rather about the book is that did you ever feel like this was a meditation on loneliness specifically or a meditation on creativity yeah, or did one mm -hmm. come from the other? I mean, I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that, yeah, really what I began with was my, you know, was myself was thinking that um, loneliness had been a part of my own um, creative process. Like for a long time, I would um, go running really late at night, like midnight, uh, and then come home and then write for an hour or two. And my beloved would go to bed much earlier, but it, there was something about the um, the the loneliness of that space that I found really, um, yeah, that I found what happens is it kind of can create a receptivity um, because, um, you know, evolutionary researchers of evolutionary um, development and human beings have basically uncovered the idea that we, that, that loneliness is a, evolutionary um, advantage. It, it mm -hmm. gets people to want to reach out and work with other people and like, oh, I, I want to know what those people are doing over there. So I'll help build bridges or roads and we'll get connected and then we'll, we'll, you know, create something out of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was um, something that like, you know, when I was writing really late at night, that sort of wanting to reach out is the thing that kind of, pushed me to do something mm -hmm. um, like if you feel really satisfied if you feel like content and all of those things you may not feel a need to reach out and create something or right or externalize the 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 your internal life so that you yourself can kind of look at it um and that's when it really started to to open up for me um and to see it as as for, I'm, I'm not going to say that every creative person writes out of loneliness or creates out of loneliness. I think it's a, it's a pretty clear, um, consistent mm -hmm. um, force in a lot of people's lives. I mean, there's a reason beh behind the trope of the tortured artist that um, people need to work through their feelings, work through their humanity, and um, and hopefully turn it into something creative if they're lucky or so inclined. Um, I, this reminds me of, um, speaking of then, I suppose, tortured artists, I loved one of the uh, anecdotes you had about your own childhood with the kid in the bus with the glass <laughs> eye. Um, you know, maybe even, you know, kids at an early age learning that there is this loneliness. I think that that's true, that I think mm -hmm. that, that it begins. And that's something I certainly saw in the people that I was writing about, that right. a lot of them, it, they're already talking about loneliness when they're quite, quite young. Yeah. I mean, the only reason I ask you to highlight that actually really heartbreaking story about the kid in um, the uh, bus is just thinking about, boy, that suffering is, is lifelong and we have to overcome so many things, especially in our childhood. And the, the traumas that we feel in childhood can certainly obviously leads to loneliness in our adulthood often, whether or not it's real or perceived, but 
Leading me to uh, one of my favorite quotes that I really latched onto was where you say loneliness can be the catalyst for creativity because it pushes us to reach out and express the inexpressible. So um, knowing that it fills a void, well, can you talk about creativity filling a void or if, um, um, emptiness and how that's the through line of these characters? For instance, um, what, what I mentioned, Zora uh, Neil Hurston, the very specifically, um, you tell the anecdote about how she was fortunate enough, I would say, to be an assistant to somebody who was in a traveling Gilbert and Sullivan troupe. And she felt like the circus had come and she had a mm -hmm. thrilling time um, traveling with them. And she felt part of the group. Um, and even though they ribbed her being mostly northerners and she was from the south, they ribbed her for being from the south. She felt part of a group. And that made her feel very much not lonely. So coming to that, back to that, how does creativity fill that void? Well, I think it, um, I mean, suddenly I want to say, I'm not sure it fills the void so much as lets the void kind of speak. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've, at the core, I have a, a deep sense of a psychoanalytic model, and which is that, you know, to really, know ourselves is the way to to you know make changes in our lives and to and to really be fully who we are and that um that that like a, a creative acts brings something um up from the depth uh of ourselves out that we can look at it and and learn from it um mm -hmm. because it's rarely just like here here is this thing that is exactly the thing that's in me it's usually just this creative thing it's this thing that we created that we can then have conversations about and learn from um and i think that that and it's also like i think um adding something to the world so if, i mean i guess if there's a whole like it pre it produces something that that did not exist before and and you know ultimately if you if we want to think of it as a hole or a void in the life that creating something is a way to fill a void mm -hmm. um you know creating a book or a poem or something but but also i don't necessarily think it i mean i think it can be creative in lots of ways i mean those are kind of traditional ways of thinking about um uh, thinking about um Art, but I think it's also just being um, aware that everything that we do can be a kind of everything that we do or say is a kind of expressive um, act. That everything mm -hmm. that I'm saying now is sort of expressing my sense of the world, um, and it gives us, you know, a way of of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about everything that you are expressing. Another theme that you hit on a lot is about uh, vulnerability and intimacy that through the creative process, hopefully you, you do have to expose vulnerability in your expression, but that that then can help curb loneliness. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a kind of really complicated situation in that, um, that what what loneliness is 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 usually thought of in terms of um quality of relationship rather than quantity of relationship so that like you can have a ton of friends and this is why so many people in cities um indicate a feeling of loneliness like they can live in new york city and feel very alone um and it's because you can be surrounded by people but if the relationships aren't aren't depth uh, aren't deep if they don't have depth if they don't have a kind of lasting nature if they feel just transitory um that you're apt to feel lonely and that it is sort of like qualities of duration stability and reciprocal vulnerability that give us a feeling of a, like a quality in our relationships and so i think you know that that's part of the thing of 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 being creative and producing art and artful things is that you are like i said keep saying is bringing this 
interior self out and presenting mm -hmm. it before the world. And, and mm -hmm. that is a sort of like opening an opening move. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that it can be that sometimes just, um, just acknowledging that, just just acknowledging that someone has done that um, mm -hmm. means that it gives you permission to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, you know, and to also be open to it and not run for, I mean, that becomes one of the, the blocks for vulnerability is that we see someone being vulnerable and we run from it. Yeah. Whereas it gives us the opportunity to do the opposite thing, which is to say, hey, Oh yeah, really? This is this is a pretty yeah. You're a human, and I'm a human being too. And what you even to say, look, that really moved me. What you said really moved me. Indicates something. It opens you. Yeah. Uh, and I think that like if we, the more that we do that, the more that we make space for that kind of intimacy and vulnerability. Um, and it comes with risk. I mean. Um, but but if we if we do that, then we have the possibility for more um, meaningful, deep relationships. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, I mean, it really takes that kind of risk. And that, but it's the you know the, that's the use of loneliness is it creates a need for that connection. And then I say, okay, I I want to take a risk to fulfill that need uh, for connection with other people. And, and it's not always going to pay off, but sometimes it will. And I think for me, it's also important, just the general economy of it. And, you know, like talking about these things, talking about um, our feelings, like here we are, two guys talking about our feelings on a podcast. I mean, <laughs> come on, Damon, mm -hmm. come on. <laughs> Uh, you know, that doesn't happen all, all that often. I mean, right. it happens in a podcast or it might happen in the classroom, but you know, you go to the store, you run into somebody at the store or the post office and you say, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Okay. Catch you later. Right. Like that, you know, maybe that's true or maybe it's not. And yeah. you know, like, or you go to a party and you watch people just like give 50 seconds or whatever. They have three minutes that they'll talk to this person. Then I have to move to, and you know, I mean, look, I don't think it has to be everywhere and, and all the time, but some places and to just say, oh, well, this is something that we allow ourselves to do and that it's important for us to think about it and talk about it and make room for it. Yep. Um, the more people that say that and do that and, and um, normalize it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It takes it takes the shame and stigma away from him. And like, this is something that keeps coming up in conversations that that particularly I have to say particularly with men but they you know but not only and they say um well if I say that I really am lonely or feel like I need connections with people I feel like that's just neediness mm -hmm. and there's a <laughs> there's a difference between need and neediness and right. you know if if the researchers are right that that loneliness is a natural inclination um, for reaching out to other people that makes community possible, then that's not needy. That's to be expected. Um, and to say that we need people is, is not to give up our sense of self-reliance or independence or, um, but it is to say, look, other people matter to me and I want to know other people and I want other people to know me. And that yeah. comes back to the reciprocity of it. We've definitely been socialized. We as men have been socialized not to be able to often express that need. Um, and frankly, probably Americans an awful lot of the time, uh, sh that show of weakness is um, not endemic here an awful lot of the time. Um, something, one quick point I was thinking about also, as you talk about back to vulnerability and um, intimacy, or rather taking risks and making uh, yourself vulnerable, is not only is that in the process of overcoming loneliness to connect with people, but all of these artists that you mention, I mean, we as artists, of course, have our insecurities and our egos, and yet we pursue artistic expression with great risk because it is so terrifying to... Um, to make good art, which usually is founded in vulnerability and exposing our underbelly and 
exposing our fears and our dreams and knowing that people are going to criticize and knowing people are going to laugh and point. And yet that is um, the motivator for it because yeah. with great risk comes great reward, be it overcoming loneliness and being creative. Those go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's really the core of it. Mm -hmm. um, so in the process of writing your book and in your uh, studies, have you found, aside from these folks who in your, in your book, the six artists you talk about, don't exactly overcome loneliness. They work through it. But have you ever found somebody who was actually successful at overcoming loneliness? Well, I think that there are um, different there are different kinds of loneliness. I mean, there's the loneliness that is um, occasional in the sense of it being tied to a specific um, situation, say the death of a loved one or sure. moving to a new place and not having those connections and it taking time to find it. And that, you know, some people can find that that. Um, that over time and doing different things, they can, they can kind of connect with that. Um, and so I think that those people can find, um, since it comes out of occasion, they can find ways to navigate it or just, you know, through time. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to really get at is the, the sort of, the structures of um, chronic loneliness in which it can come up, yep. you know, all the time or, you know, recurringly, even to people such as myself, I have friends, I have a great uh, marriage, long time. And, you know, you know, on paper, I shouldn't be lonely, but you know, it, it still happens. Yep. Um, and I think that was the thing that really, when I started to, to listen to people and, and read about how so many people, philosophers and psychologists and psychoanalysts and and so forth philosophers find it to be just a, a, an intrinsic part of being human i mean i think you know there's ultimately no um it's not something that you cure i mean you know like also you know depression is something i've periodically felt you don't cure depression you mm -hmm. you manage it you navigate it you hold it at bay, um, and uh, that is to me a huge success. And then, yeah. and, and then you find ways to, in fact, not only uh, keep it at bay, but maybe harness these things. Uh, that I think is really what is really at the core. And like I said, if it's also just part of a evolutionary need, then you know, existentially, it's not going to go away. Um, Evolu in evolutionary terms, we're not going to solve it. There, there's a difference between, and we probably should, have, or I should have said this early on, the difference between solitude and loneliness. Sure. You know, solitude is something, usually, is something people choose, mm -hmm. whereas loneliness finds you. And right. solitude is being okay with being by yourself. It's healthy or it's restorative. It's getting in touch with your your deepest self. and 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 you know being finding that good company but loneliness comes on its own right um but it still is something that um you you want to be able to acknowledge and recognize and because there's so much stigma attached to it uh people have difficulty even recognize it certainly even admitting it to themselves because then like i said it they don't necessarily even want to admit it or recognize it because they feel like it's a neediness mm -hmm. So, so in some ways, yeah, I would say, yeah, occasional loneliness can be, can be resolved, but the sort of existential loneliness, that's something that we learn is part of our human nature. So then piggybacking on that and bringing it back to my original question, do you have any prescription that you've learned that can be a, how do people who might be listening work through their own loneliness? What would you say to them? I mean, I think that um, really what um, the people that I look at in the book and, and people that I didn't necessarily write about but are connected to it, 
They have a tendency to want to teach us how to look at other people, how to understand other people, um, how to recognize loneliness in other people. Um, and I think that that's ultimately what um, art can do is teach us how other people look at other people. So that like, for instance, Walker Evans, who takes these photographs of people on the subway in, in New York um, in the 30s and 40s, and he do does it with this hidden camera. This is before iPhones and all that. He um, you know, hides it in his jacket and he takes them and they have no idea they're being photographed. And we're seeing essentially what Walker Evans sees in looking at these people. But... It's you can look at the p pictures and see, oh, I'm looking at people, but also we have to remember we're looking at him looking at other people, and now we ourselves are looking at him looking at other people mm -hmm. and seeing them and seeing them, you know, like the face that you know, Evans talks about this basically wearing the face that they wear in the mirror at home. Um, it's not performed. It's not like trying to look because they're, you know, it's New York subway. So they don't even know anyone's paying any attention mm. and sort of realizing that humanity. So I think that like, you know, finding ways to use art and creativity to know other people is mm -hmm. ultimately what it is. Knowing ourselves, knowing other people, which maybe that sounds mystical, but I think it begins with, you know, I am moved. I listen to this music and I'm moved by it and other people are moved by it. What are we moved by? Um, what does that tell us about uh, that these things move us? And, you know, knowing that you, then you can create something of your own if you want to. But I think ultimately um, that desire to recognize and want to participate in humanity is really at the core of it. And I think mm -hmm. is at the core of creativity because again, the loneliness spurs the creativity, which means that we want to reach out to other people and we want to reach out in such a way that it connects with them. So we need to know what, what people connect to, not to please them, but to have them uh, have a kind of back and forth recognition. So I think that's ultimately yep. what it is. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, it's, it's right there in front of us. What artistic experience have, has most recently thrilled you? Can I tell a different story? Please, <laughs> if you would like to, sure. Uh, <laughs> you I, mean, it, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a good question, but I, I you know, there is a, a moment that it happened in my life that I, I go to very frequently mm -hmm. that I think is really also what kind of art is about and that like collective experience. It was, so it was years ago, it was when I was a musician and I was studying jazz and I was in Boston where I lived at the time. And I was at the old tower records, you know, huge building full records, as it says, it's a tower made of records. Um, and they had a whole uh, section for jazz. Like it was a soundproof room, really big. And it was all CDs and albums and cassettes of, of, of jazz, which I was really, really into. And it was a kind of a, it was a early Friday night, um, I, you know, things were going to happen later that night, but they weren't happening yet. So I felt this, you know, this sort of like listless loneliness. And I went into tower. I lived not far from it. And I went up to the jazz room and they had a bookcase. And in this bookcase, they had all these, you know, biographies of jazz musicians and things like that. I remember crouching down, it was the bottom shelf. And I was looking at, I pulled some book off and I was just crouched down and I was looking at the book. And they had these monitors in the center of the room that would play. I mean, like, you know, they would do that in the rock and roll, two-bit and jazz. They had these four all playing the same concert. Mm -hmm. And it was Miles Davis, uh, you know, a late um, concert, uh, late 80s, early 90s. He's playing in Paris. And I can't remember what song it was. I think it was his version of Cyndi Lauper's Time After Time, which is amazingly beautiful. Uh -huh. And I was reading the book and suddenly I realized I was, I had like turned my head and was sort of craning it to watch the monitor. And I hadn't even realized I had stopped to do that. I just was like one of those, like kind of popped into my, 
wait a minute, I'm listening. I thought I was looking at this book. I'm listening to the solo that Miles is doing, and it's just really beautiful. And from my vantage point, my eye dropped down. And there was about 12, 10 or 12 other people in this space. And I realized slowly, as, my, as I sort of panned across the room, that everyone else in the room had stopped what they were doing and was turned and watching this uh, Miles Davis play the solo. Even so far as I looked up at the front at the cash register and there was somebody buying a CD and he had um, the money out in his hand, handing it to the cashier. And he <laughs> was turned around mid, you know, mid handing over the, of the cash, staring at the monitor, listening to, and, and even the cashier had his hand just like hovering in the air to take the money watching miles so that wow. everybody in the place stopped everybody completely independent of one another completely involuntarily swept up by the music and there and i realized that this was really what music this is what art is about that sort of like incredibly intimate moment of recognition of humanity that we were all experiencing individually but collectively and i was mm -hmm. like that is what art of whatever form that's what it's about, that sort of like individual connection collectively experienced. That's a great way to end. Thank you for sharing so much. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for your crusade at helping people feel less alone in the classroom or in the podcast sphere or just in life. Um, thanks for joining us, Richard. Well, thanks so much, Kevin. This has been really, uh, really um, a lovely conversation. And thanks for having me.